the one thing that I've learned is if you make a mistake, you make a mistake and you can't get too upset about it because in this podcast, I've stumbled a little bit. People stumble a little bit, forget a word, you mispronounce something. It's just part of everyday conversation. And if the goal is to be as natural and normal as possible on TV, then you got to give yourself a break if you stumble around or mess up a name or whatever the case may be. I think if you just don't take it too seriously and make a mistake, that's the best way to approach it. Welcome to the Midland Money Mindset. This is a podcast that's all about getting your mind right when it comes to all things money. In every episode, we go deep with engaging guests who provide tangible takeaways and a whole lot of joy along the way. I hope you enjoy these conversations as much as I enjoyed having them. Let's dive into today's show. I'm Larry Sprung, your host for the Midland Money Mindset and founder and wealth advisor of Midland Financial. Today's guest is Bill Pito, studio host for MSG Networks. Bill Pito joined MSG Networks in 2009 and currently serves as a studio host for Knicks Games, as well as the well-known host of the New York Emmy Award-winning MSG 150 that airs during Knicks and Ranger Games. This past summer, Bill also hosted the popular expanded version of the MSG 150, which featured engaging conversation and nightly analysis of the latest news and sports. Prior to his work with MSG, Bill was an anchor at ESPN where he hosted Sports Smash, in the inaugural year of ESPN2. In addition, he's anchored NHL Tonight, NFL Primetime, Baseball Tonight, and Sports Center during his tenure there. Listen in and hear about Bill's journey to MSG Networks and the launch of the MSG 150, the fastest 150 seconds in sports, a sprung household favorite. Well, hello, everybody. Larry Sprung here, and I have the awesome pleasure of being with Bill Pito, a studio host for MSG Networks, and as many of you know, the host of the MSG 150, a fan favorite of mine. I love it, and as a hockey person, the Rangers piece is always something that I look forward to every night when there's a Ranger game. So thanks for joining us, Bill. Larry, it's great to be with you. Thanks so much for having me on your podcast. Yeah, it's great to have you here. And before we jump in and talk a little bit about you and where you are today, I want to give our listeners a little bit of background about what led you to becoming a studio host for MSG Networks. What was your path to where you are today? Well, for anybody that chooses an on-air career in television, it's a long and windy road. (laughs) At times, there are bumps... uh, as well. I started off in Binghamton, New York, graduated from Cornell in 1987. My first salary was $6 an hour. I think that job still pays $6 an hour. (laughs) My rent was $120 a month. Um, But that's where you start when you want to do this. I went to Syracuse. I was in Boston at New England Cable News in the early 90s. And then I got an audition for SportsCenter at ESPN in February 93. I didn't get the job at the time. They actually ended up hiring someone I worked with in Binghamton. Carl Ravitch beat me out for the spot in February (laughs) of 93. Trey Wingo, by the way, was also in Binghamton when I was there as well in the late 1980s. He also obviously had a great career at ESPN. So Ravitch got the job for ESPN in 93 in February. Then they hired me for ESPN2, the launch of ESPN2 in August of 93. I was at ESPN doing all kinds of things on all kinds of networks from 93 to 08. And I've been at MSG since 2009. Now I'm a native New Yorker. So we moved West when I was seven, but my formative years as a sports fan were around the Knicks championship basketball team. So working at MSG now as a native New Yorker, being (laughs) a huge Knicks fan, being the Knicks studio host, getting to see Clyde Frazier every day is in many ways a dream come true. So ESPN there for 15 years, great run. I I really believe in many ways I belong where I am right now as a host on MSG Networks, given my background and given my initial exposure to sports. That's awesome. Now, you said you were in Binghamton in the late 80s. Is that right? That is right. 1987 WBNG, Action News. So I was in Binghamton. I went to college there and a good buddy of mine, believe it or not, while we were in college, it was at that time, it was the Binghamton Rangers not the Ottawa Senators team or Devils. They were Binghamton Rangers. A buddy of mine was uh, Rocky the Raccoon, 
and ended up parlaying that into a job with the Rangers after college. So very interesting. And it was nice to have the Rangers when I went to school there. So so what years were you up there? I was up there 92 to 96. Okay. And, so uh, when I was there, the Caps and the Whalers split the affiliation with Binghamton. Gotcha. It wasn't a Rangers affiliate. So half the roster was Hartford property <laughs> and half the roster was Caps property. I was there from 87 to 89. That must have changed. And I, I played hockey up there. We used to play at the Polar Ice Cap, which I'm sure you heard of. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But Binghamton was a fun place to be as a young guy, you know? Yeah, it was a good school experience, good education. And for the purposes of what I do, I came out with no debt, which was even more fantastic at that time. So That's great. So, Bill, where does your passion for sports come from? What is it rooted in? So when I was a little boy, I used to watch uh, in New York, Kiner's Corner, watch the Mets. I can almost recite the starting Mets lineup from the early 1970s. <laughs> Wayne Garrett, Felix Mian, George Theodore, John Milner. My dad was a huge sports fan. My grandfather was a huge sports fan. And it was just a huge part of my childhood. The first thing I could ever read was the sports page in the New York Times. So I was just always something that I was interested in. And I was involved in high school on the high school newspaper. When I got to Cornell, which is where I went to college, I right away got involved on the student radio station, got a lot of on-air experience. Actually, at the time I was at Cornell, I was very lucky. The Ithaca, the city of Ithaca started a local newscast. They wanted a lot of us who were young and cheap to work on it. So I actually was a sportscaster on that channel. That's where I first met Carl Ravitch. So it's always been a passion of mine. And to do this, Larry, you have to really be focused on the pursuit because it's a, something that you only get better at with repetition. And I tell anybody that wants to pursue this, that you need to get on the air as soon and as early as you possibly can. Yeah, I will tell you. I mean, now it makes sense after you tell them that story about the Knicks, because uh, when you're on air, the passion that you have definitely comes through. You exude that passion about the Knicks and the Rangers when you're talking about them. And you could tell that it's something that you're super passionate about for sure. Well, it helps when they the Knicks go 41 and 31 <laughs> and finish fourth overall in the East and shock everybody with one of the most surprising seasons in the history of the league. That helps the passion. That is for sure. That's, and the Rangers are exciting now, too. They All are. The young talent, hopefully another year under their belts with development and maturity, and hopefully they're ready to take the next step as well. Yeah, great stuff. So you've had the luxury of being on both air on TV and on radio as well. So do you prefer one or the other? And what's the reasoning behind that? So what's interesting is to me, as I've gone through, I think it's a completely different skill set. I was on Mad Dog Radio after ESPN. Before I went to MSG, I was a host of the midday show with a co-host from 10 to 2. And I would just say that as a TV host, which I've been 99.9% .9 of my career, brevity and succinctness is the most important attribute. When you're on the radio for four hours, you can be long-winded. <laughs> you can ask questions that last two minutes. So it's like going from a sprinter to a long-distance runner, and it's right. very hard to do. I think in many ways, it's easier to go from radio to TV. To go from TV to radio like I did for that brief period of time was a huge challenge. I'm also not that passionate about debating hot take topics. Right. So I think I'm ideally suited to do what I do. Uh, the radio was a great experience. When you have to ad lib your way through a four hour talk show on the radio, that's a whole different skill set and it can really help you on TV. But the radio deal there is not my preferred mode of communication. Let's say that. Yeah, I never understood how people could debate what shoulda, coulda, or maybe didn't happen for a couple hours. It's crazy. So it's funny that you brought that up because it's an interesting dynamic when you hear all that. Well, what's interesting in, in terms of my career, when I was on SportsCenter in the 90s, people watched us for the results. There wasn't any internet. There wasn't any Twitter. There weren't all of these different channels. So if you wanted to know if the Detroit Tigers won, you'd have to watch Baseball the Night or SportsCenter. What's happened now is everybody knows the result. That's why all these cable networks are assessing the reasons for what happened and why things happened as opposed to just telling you the result. Right. Back in my era when Sports Center was the place, the thing, it was more about telling you the result as opposed to having opinion on to why things happen. It's a great perspective, and I, I agree. Now, you are primarily involved, as we discussed, with the Knicks and the Rangers. So I got to ask you, do you have a favorite sport? I mean, you may have already said that basketball is it. I don't know. 
It may not be basketball or hockey at all. I mean, do you have an overall favorite? Love the NBA. I've always loved the NBA. I've been involved with hockey studios in different places most of my career. I have a huge liking of hockey. Never played it, though. I like the NFL, and that's about it. I am not a baseball guy. In fact, as I get older, I don't even dabble in baseball at all. For some reason, I just don't have any interest. I can tell you in general terms right now that the Mets are in first place. The (laughs) Yankees are a disappointment, but beyond that, I really can't help you. Because it seems like when you were a kid, baseball was a big part of your life because you said you could still recite the rosters. What kind of caused you to sway away from that as a sport of choice, if you will? It might be because it's just not part of my work anymore. I don't have a need. In the summers, I tend to relax and not watch as much, obviously, as I do during the year. You know, during the year when we are involved with the Knicks and the Rangers from October to April, it's pretty much nonstop. So I'll watch the World Series. I enjoyed watching the Dodgers last year, but I don't really follow baseball day to day. The NFL is much easier to follow because it's only one day a week right? or a handful of days a week. Right. Yeah, I'm with you. I used to watch baseball a lot more when I was a kid. I don't know if it's the time commitment or what have you, but come playoff time a little bit, I'll start watching it. The World Series becomes a little more exciting. Hockey, I could watch any game. Rangers are my team of choice, but if they're not on, I can turn on any hockey game and get into it and enjoy it for sure. See, that's one of the things, Larry, it's very interesting. I think for this league to grow, it's important for someone like you and other fans like you who may be Ranger fans who will sit and watch Chicago play Detroit. I will. <laughs> okay, because I think you're in the minority. One of the problems is, is because it's such a regional sport and that the Ranger fan is crazy about the Rangers, will watch every Ranger game, but won't necessarily sit down and watch other teams. If more fans can become like you, that'll be great for the sport. Yeah, I mean, I've told this story before on our show, but my wife and I went a couple of years ago. We happened to be in Nevada and the Vegas Knights were playing the Winnipeg Jets in the Western Conference Finals. So we went to the game and it was, I think, the inaugural season that the Vegas was in the league. And we were going around the town of Las Vegas and the buzz and the excitement and all I kept walking around and my wife said, you got to stop this already. I was like, this is unbelievable for the game of hockey. And I'm excited. I'm going to be in Vegas this coming October. And I'm excited to hopefully catch the Vegas Knights against the Seattle Kraken, hopefully, which would be great. So I'm excited for any team, any hockey game, any time I can watch. That's fantastic. It's going to be very interesting to see how it goes with Seattle. We all know Vegas has done really well in its first year made the cup final. The expansion draft uh, held over the summer, and it'll be interesting to see. I thought Seattle with Dave Haxtall as the coaching uh, hire was kind of an interesting choice. But Ron Francis knows what he's doing. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean, I'm interested to see. I think that they were at a little bit of a disadvantage because we already went through the Vegas going through the expansion draft only a couple of years ago. So I think some of the teams got wise to the process to some degree. And I don't know if that hurt or put them in a worse position than Vegas was, but it's going to be interesting to see and how they take what they started with from the expansion draft and what they do between now and the start of the season. It's going to be pretty interesting, I think. I agree. I, you know, they could have taken a lot of high end players. Agreed. Gary Price, Landis Cog, Tara Sanko. Sanko. Yeah, I was, yeah. We were surprised by some of that names. But at the same time, I think a lot of people questioned it when Vegas did it. And there were second and third tier names, if you will, in their starting lineup. But they really gelled together and they all had a chip on their shoulder. And it really worked to their advantage, I feel. I tell you, to be an expansion team like Vegas and make the cup final in your first year, I mean, that's a pretty high bar for Seattle right now, that's for yeah. sure. Well, now the Rangers have their coach, so hopefully he had something to do with that and he could bring some of it here to New York, hopefully. We'll see. Gerard Gallant's an interesting choice. I think the one thing about this team as we get ready for the regular season is that Chris Drury wanted to make sure that he had a roster where they could define roles. Right. The last year, you had too many top six forwards. The guys that were playing the bottom six were probably not best suited for that. I think now with a better balance, hopefully, on the roster, that they'll be a more effective team. I'm looking forward to it. And hopefully they have a little more toughness, too, because I think we're lacking a little bit of that. But we'll see how that goes. The way we met each other was... You had reached out regarding a video of my son, Jeremy, who you ended up using on your MSG 150. So before we jump into the MSG 150 and what that is all about, for those 
that don't know or aren't aware of the MSG 150, which I don't know how many people wouldn't know if they're into the Knicks or the Rangers or sports in general. But just in case, can you tell the listeners a little bit about what the MSG 150 is all about? So years ago now, and it's years plural, our management came up with an idea to try to hold people through halftime and intermission, particularly in many ways, the hockey intermission. Hockey intermission goes 17 minutes. And they wanted to come up with a segment for one of the content segments to try and hold the audience. So somehow they came up with two and a half minutes is the time of the segment. They concocted the clock. But the real genius behind the segment is Jeff Ostella, who our producer, who I think you probably interacted with as well. And he is online all day long coming up with these clips. And his creativity on a nightly basis is what makes it look unbiased. But his creativity makes it interesting. They're not just generic highlights. They're interesting things like Larry Sprung's son going for a hat trick coming home and his other son has a huge celebration for him. I mean, that's the kind of stuff (laughs) that people love and we have access to it. And if we get access to it, we like to put it on. That's amazing. So the 150 is a culmination of a bunch of different highlights, whether it be from the NHL itself, minor leagues, or even just youth hockey. And you're basically creating this content and creating 150 seconds worth of content to keep the watcher online and engaged through the process. So they stay involved between period one and period two and period two and period three, et cetera. Is that a fair synopsis? You said it better than I did. (laughs) And we're trying to have fun with more than anything. We have the two and a half minutes exactly. Jeff Ostella has it timed perfectly. His challenge is some of the creative stuff is already edited, but the highlights of that night then have to fit into the time so that we never go over 150 seconds. We never go really under 150 seconds. It's a miracle how he's able to time this segment. But the goal and the point, we're trying to have fun with video. That is the overriding theme and philosophy that we try to uh, put on the air. So one of the things I was going to ask you, which I think you already gave us the answer to, this was not a Bill Pito idea. This was really thought about by management, and you're really just a deliverer of this great content. Right. I happen to be the one that was selected to do this. Thankfully, we all have different skill sets and our fast-paced highlights suit what I do. Thankfully, I I like to have fun. I don't take myself too seriously. I don't take the subject matter too seriously. And hopefully, we're keeping viewers from turning the channel during the intermission or the halftime. So hopefully, uh, we're accomplishing that. Well, again, I may be the exception to the rule like before, but I know that one of the things that we do is we keep it on because we don't want to miss the MSG 150 because we always find some really good nuggets that are in there. A lot of fun. You know, you have your normal stuff that you guys have to show. And then there's always that cool, funny, lighthearted stuff that ends up showing up there, which is really what we're staying tuned for. Well, I thank you very much. Jeff does a great job. We just try to make it different. You know, the challenge with all of the content that's out there, all these different platforms and different channels and different websites is to be original. That's a huge challenge, but uh, we try to do our best with that uh, every single time that we come to work. I mean, maybe you could speak to this. I mean, what does it really take to put that thing together? I mean, I would imagine, are you doing it like the same day, the day before? I know there's going to be some of that stock, if you will, content that you may have from the highlights from that night's game. But I mean, is that just being finalized like minutes before it's going on air? Or is it something that's almost prepackaged in advance of the show that night? So the games of that night happen in real time. We have a bunch of college kids that come in and log the games. So if there's five games, we have five sets of eyes on the games helping Jeff compile the highlights. Maybe that's half of the 150 seconds. The other half, when Jeff comes in, he has an idea of the creative clips that he wants to put on, and he compiles that. So that part is already edited before the night begins. So at 7.30, let's say half of it's done from creative material that has happened the night before, or he sees it on the internet, or maybe it's a couple of days old. And then the other half happens in real time as he puts together the highlights of the games that night. Sounds like a very difficult mathematical equation to me when it's all said and done to get this all packed in in that 150 seconds and actually make it end on time. It seems like it's impossible, but he does such a great job of it. The challenge is that night again. So he may have, let's say, 60 seconds of fun from the night before that's already edited. He knows he's got that already in the can. And then fitting that night's action to the remaining time is the challenge. 
look, we've been at it a while. He's got it down to a science. He's good at what he does because it's crazy if you think about everything that's got to get into that and then cut it down. So is he scouring everywhere, like the whole basically internet universe for clips for that fun piece, depending upon what direction he wants to go in? Yeah, he'll be on Twitter. Uh, He'll be on YouTube. We have the ability to transfer video from Twitter or from YouTube to our editing system so that then we can put it on our, our air. For example, I think we saw your son's hat trick on Twitter, right? I don't even know how we got to it. I think we did. Yeah, I believe I put it up on Twitter. And then I think I got a message from your account saying that you would like to talk to me and I don't monitor it all the time. So I got a gentle email from another MSG employee who's been on our show, by the way, Rick Nadu, saying, hey, Larry, check your Twitter messages. Bill Pito's trying to get in touch with you about Jeremy. <laughs> and then it all snowballed from there. But thankfully, he was able to connect with me, knew where I was. Otherwise, I may have missed that Twitter message. So, so when we use video like your sons, we need to get approval from the family. Right. Right. That's why that we sense. reached out for sure. We needed details as well on what was going on. But Right. Yeah, that makes sense. That's funny. So I got to ask you, you've been doing this for a while. You, and correct me if I'm wrong, was it always 150 or was it shorter and then you made it longer over a period of time? It's always been the MSG 150. To be honest, though, I don't remember what year it started. I think maybe 13, 14 or I don't remember. Hmm. Because for some reason, I thought it started out 60 seconds or 90 seconds and then grew from there at some point. They used to replay the Knicks and Rangers game in something called the Knicks in 60. Right. Or the Rangers in 60 when they would condense the whole game game to an hour. Maybe that's what you're thinking about. Yeah, I don't know. I've watched those two sometimes when I can't watch it live. So that might be it. So you've seen a lot of these clips. You've done a lot of these MSG 150s. So My question to you is, do you have a personal favorite from a clip that just stands out in your mind and you're like, man, that was like one of the best clips we've ever shown on the MSG 150? A yearly favorite, Larry, is the baby races from around the NBA. (laughs) (laughs) Sacramento always has a a great baby race. (laughs) Sidney Crosby, I don't know if you saw this, you may have had a remarkable goal this past season where his stick broke. He went to the bench, got a replacement stick from the equipment manager, rejoined the play and scored. Yeah. And then after the puck went into the net, everybody on the bench hugged the equipment guy. (laughs) So that was an incredible, incredible clip. The Vegas minor league team, I don't remember where it is. The AHL team, it's in uh, Nevada somewhere. They have like a bugle blower who comes down and (laughs) it's like, (laughs) that's how he's announces the lineup with like a bugle a guy with a scroll and a bugle it's just <laughs> hilarious so that was a memorable clip that we had i'll have to find that one i know the baby races are that's definitely a fan favorite i always enjoy that and the Sidney crosby clip how can you forget that i mean that was amazing i think they ended up giving him the equipment manager like the game puck and i think they tried to get him on the score sheet for the assist but they weren't successful in that we've also had a over the years a, a good theme about when there's emergency goalies who get in yeah a couple of years ago remember the guy the emergency goalie like got the win over toronto for carolina i think yeah and then there was one in chicago a few years before that Right. That's good for one or two shots a year for sure. When you get the third string insurance salesman who's got to put on <laughs> put on the goalie gear and show up in an NHL game. Yeah, I think Chicago, the guy was an accountant and he popped right. in there and he ended up getting the win, which is amazing. And I think that's shown a light on the sport because a lot of people didn't even realize how that works. I know a lot of fans thought to some degree, oh, I, you know, I know we have two goalies. What happens if something happens to both? And they never realize that there has to be an emergency goaltender there in the arena ready to go. It's a home team's responsibility, actually, to make sure someone is either in the arena or very close by. Yeah, I used to play with the guy who was that person for the New York Islanders. So he always had to be in a certain geographic radius and he is couldn't that right? play. So he was like on call? Oh, yeah. He couldn't play men's league that night for us because he had to be ready to go. And if he wasn't at the arena, he had a he couldn't be further than a certain distance from the arena that he could get there in time, get dressed and get out there if they needed him. Oh, that's interesting. So, that's, 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 yeah. that's interesting. It's crazy what some athletes and how that they weave that into sports. So, yeah, it's amazing. So, Bill, what's up next for you? Do you have anything big on your agenda that's coming up in the near future? 
Well, I'm just looking forward to the season. You know, it's going to be something that I always look forward to. And it's always better when they're competitive. And the Knicks, fingers crossed, are going to take the next step forward. And it's going to be fun to cover that and really hopeful for the Rangers. And we have a real intense six or seven months, and then we get a lot of time off. So I've been off for a while. I'm revved up and ready to go for another season of Rangers and Knicks. Do you foresee the announcers? Are they going to be back on the road with the teams come the fall, or are they going to be doing the remote thing again like last year? It's going to be interesting to see. I think in a lot of industries, COVID may have accelerated things that may have happened five years down the line. And in the TV industry, as you're alluding to, announcers, for the most part, did not travel to away games. Right. So last year, Sam and Joe or Mike Breen and Clyde Frazier are calling the road games from the studio from the feed supplied by the road team, which really, in a lot of ways, saved our network and other networks a lot of money because you don't have to travel, you don't have the per diem, you don't have to hire the crew or travel the whole crew. It's a work in progress. It'll be interesting to see how it goes this year. But I can tell you, Clyde Frazier is real happy last year because he could just take the cab back to his apartment, even when the team was in Chicago or Sacramento or wherever it was. Yeah, I mean, just for life and your ability to be around your family just makes you, you know, I think about a guy like Sam Rosen, who's been doing this for so long and how he would be on the road so much. And then, you know, over the last year or so, he probably had the luxury of being around his family a heck of a lot more because he didn't have to worry about all that travel time. Although I think the guys will tell you they, they prefer the travel in a lot of ways because they get to know the players and they're around the team a lot more. Right. Also being in the arena, sometimes these calls are very hard to figure out when you're not on site. So I think any play-by-play person and analyst would tell you they'd rather be in the arena. But obviously, it was a lot less wear and tear on these guys without the travel last year, for sure. And for you, you pretty much just go into the studio, right? That's your role. So you're not having to travel there all around anyway. I've never traveled, really. These guys know the country. (laughs) I think that would be a nice benefit to travel around and get to know these cities a little bit. I've never done that. Maybe I speak as someone who would like to do that because I've never done it before. (laughs) But uh, no, I've never traveled. Yeah. Two last questions. So what's the mindset needed? Because you go into the studio, if there's a Ranger or Knicks game, you have to be on, you have to be ready. What's the mindset needed? Because we know not everybody has the best days every day, but Regardless, when that light goes on and you're on air, you got to put it on. What's the mindset needed to act in that role? I think those of us that have been doing this or do this are kind of adrenaline junkies. You know, we're performers. And I think we get a huge thrill out of having to be on and you get charged and, you know, you got the adrenaline going and you got you're honed in on what's happening. And I just think it becomes part of who you are. And I don't think twice about it. I think the one thing that I've learned is if you make a mistake, you make a mistake and you can't get too upset about it because in this podcast, I've stumbled a little bit. People stumble a little bit, forget a word, you mispronounce something. It's just part of everyday conversation. And if the goal is to be as natural and normal as possible on TV, then you got to give yourself a break if you stumble around or mess up a name or whatever the case may be. I think if you just don't take it too seriously and make a mistake, that's the best way to approach it. Yeah, I think it also lends a level of authenticity, which is what you're saying. I mean, we're all people. Not everybody does everything perfectly, obviously. So it makes you more relatable in that way because you're the same as all of us. I don't know if you were watching, but this past year, my cell phone was on in the middle of 150 and my wife called. Oh, I did not see that. I don't think so. <laughs> so I said on the air, doesn't my wife know I work for a living? You know what? I vaguely do remember that. Yeah. I'm sure you took a ribbing when you went off air from the folks around you. Yeah. I would imagine. You know, that cell phone ring is supposed to be off, but I (laughs) forgot. So that's the way it goes. Hey, listen, I saw babies, puppies. You know, we have CNBC on here all the time because we're a wealth management firm. And over the past year, like I said, we saw dogs barking in people's houses and babies and kids running in. So I don't see anything wrong with it. It's just showing that these anchors and these folks on TV, they're real people too. It It humanizes it, right? 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. So listen, Bill, it's been a pleasure having you on. And we end every show asking each of our guests the same question. And that is, what did you do today that brought you joy and put you in the right mindset for success? So my daughter just started her job today and she's doing it remote. She just graduated from Wisconsin. Nice. 
And she's working for a company called Village Marketing, which pairs companies with influencers to help them advertise their product. And to see, I always joke with her that, you know, you raise your kids and they're like, in many ways, a little chicky in your hands. And now <laughs> she's ready to fly and create her own career. She's going to move to New York shortly. So just to be around that and to see her talk to her supervisor for the first time was a huge thrill. So I don't know if that prepares me for success, but it really put me in a really, really good mood. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Now, we'll have your contact information in the show notes that you provided, but just so people can hear, if people want to reach out to you, follow you, learn more about you, where and what's the best way for them to do that? Watch MSG Networks, watch the Knicks, watch the Rangers, and my Twitter handle is at Bill Pito, Bill Pito, P-I-D-T-O, and that's the best way you can direct message me on Twitter. And I will always get back to you or on Instagram at BPMSG. So, well, great. Where's the S&P going to be at the end of the year? I don't know. I don't know. I I don't know. We don't make bets on where the S&P is going to be. We want to help people reach their goals. That's the important piece. doesn't really matter where the S&P is when all said and done. It matters whether or not the families that we're serving and working with are reaching and uh, striving towards their goals. That's the most important to us. Well said. Well said. It's like when you're on air, right? Mike Tyson said, everybody has a game plan until you get punched in the face. Right. So we try to instill upon all of our clients that they want to have that game plan so that if the S&P doesn't go the way we want, we have a plan in place to attack it. So Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you. But thank you so much for taking out your time to be here. I agree with you. If you're listening and you haven't seen the MSG 150, you better get on to it. Start watching. Look at the replays. There's always fun nuggets in there and definitely watch it this season and going forward because I assure you, you will enjoy your time and you don't have to change the channel in between periods or halftime. So thanks again, Bill, and make it a great day. Larry, thank you so much for having me on and uh, it's great to meet you. Same here. I want to thank Bill Pito for being a guest on the Midland Money Mindset. Bill has taken his love of sports and created some of the most memorable moments during Knicks and Ranger games in the MSG 150. Bill and I met when he asked for a clip of myself and my oldest son, Zach, showering my youngest son, Jeremy, with hats when he got home from a hockey game after having scored a hat trick, something we will never, never forget. The MSG 150 is something we look forward to watching as a family each night during hockey season, and you should too. Bill can be found across all social media platforms, and all the contact information needed to find him can be found in the show notes. Thank you for joining us this week on the Midland Money Mindset. Make sure you visit our website at midlandmoneymindset.com and smash the subscribe button so you don't miss a show. We encourage you to help others find our valuable content and please don't keep us a secret. You can also schedule an Is There a Fit call right from our website or by using the link that you'll find in the description section of your podcast player or app. And be sure to join us for our next episode to learn more about getting your mind right when it comes to all things money. The opinions voiced in the Midland Money Mindset Show with Lawrence Sprung are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. No strategy ensures success or protects against loss. To determine what may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, financial or tax advisor prior to investing. Investment advisory services offered through CWM LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. Guests on the Midland Money Mindset Show are not affiliated with CWM LLC.